I'd like to introduce Professor Katina Michael, um, who is one of our newest faculty here, but a rock star. And um, and then usually we just go around and introduce ourselves, but go ahead, Katina, and rock and roll. <laughs> oh, rock and roll. Well, thanks everyone for coming. Um, Katina Michael, new faculty uh, in the School for the Future of Innovation Society, and also in the School for Computing Informatics and Decision Systems Engineering, uh, a joint hire which makes things always interesting. Uh, I've heralded from Australia, from the University of Wollongong, where I've spent probably close to 20 years researching um, social implications of emerging technologies. Uh, so today's seminar, uh, welcome JP, uh, is titled uh, Microchipping Employees, um, you know, do we or don't we? Uh, and what I might do in order to uh, gain a context for participation, I might go around and ask each of you to introduce yourselves and what actually attracted you to, to coming online on this topic. Nikki, we might start with you. Hi, uh, I'm Nikki. I'm a second year PhD student. Um, I spend a lot of time thinking about surveillance um, and the ways that we can evade it um, and where it's appropriate and where it's not. And so I'm super curious by the uh, do we part of Katina's talk today. Okay, uh, Stephanie Franco, uh, thanks for coming online. What was your, uh, introduce yourself please and, and tell us uh, why you were attracted to this seminar. Well, hi, good morning everybody. Um, I'm a criminal justice major and um, I'll be graduating in a couple of weeks here in May. Um, I had a prior background in law enforcement and I felt that Microchipping is something that's very interesting. I, don't, I think that it would be able to provide such a wealth of information to law enforcement, other government entities, and then that's what people are also shying away from. So it's kind of controversial in that manner. And also in my new capacity with biodesign, I feel that it's always important to know what could be coming. And since this has like a biological factor to it as well, this is something that may interest people in our center and other offices since they're social researchers. That's why I'm here. That's pretty awesome background. Thanks for sharing. <laughs> JP Nelson, uh, tell us a bit about yourself and, and what attracted you to the seminar today. Hey there, yeah, sorry, I'm, sorry I came in a little late. I was having trouble finding these. Like, um, so I'm a current um, student in the Human and Social Dimensions of Science and Technology PhD program at SFIS. Um, I was attracted to this um, seminar by a couple of things. Um, first of all, I wanted to have the opportunity to talk with you a little bit more, Katina, um, because, you know, we see, we see, another, see one another around the office quite a bit. And um, mm. I, I guess I'm getting to come to a lot of your talks in quick succession here, since I'll also be there on Monday. Um, but I just wanted the, wanted the opportunity to talk with you about your work a little bit more, um, as, as well as, um, I mean, I, I am interested in the, in, in, <clears throat> In, uh, in socio-technical efforts to um, quantify and make legible populations for um, for for understanding prediction and manipulation, um, not necessarily, although potentially, in a in a um, in a cynical sense. <laughs> so I'm, I'm I'm interested in um, in in the ways in which this or in, in the ways in which um, microchipping employees or or other persons would provide. The institutions, the institutions which are entrusted to handle their sort of met, their data-based meta lives, um, to understand them, what sorts of understandings those will engender, and what sorts of handles those will give, those will give on people, and what sorts of handles those might give people on the institutions with which they work. Awesome, thanks for sharing. Um, a bit about my journey on how I sort of came into this um, whole area. Uh, I was a full-time employee at a company called Nortel Networks in Australia. Uh, and that gave me um, the capacity to travel uh, to many different parts of the world, uh, rolling out new technologies uh, as departments of telecommunications deregulated across the world, all the way back from 2G to 3G uh, in the late uh, 1990s and early 2000s. We were going through bid responses for these um, uh, new technologies and I rolled up to work one day and uh, in my tote tray was actually uh, the Nortel newspaper. So I went to the back of the page as you do and on there was an advertisement that Nortel was sponsoring uh, Cyborg 1.0 and Cyborg 2.0, uh, the implant experiment by Professor Kevin Warwick 
at the University of Reading back in 1998 and thereafter in 2002. So here I was, a full-time employee in a telecommunications company, and all of a sudden uh, I was, I think, into the throes of what was possible. In fact, uh, we used to produce handsets at Nortel, and many of my seniors would say to me, well, it's a matter of time before we get rid of the handsets, and we do things like brain-to-brain -brain interfacing, uh, beyond brain-to-computer interfacing. So these are not new concepts. They've been around for some time. So I was aroused in terms of my research effort at that time to think, well, actually it's happening. And I was enrolled in the first year of my PhD in 1997. And so I thought, what else will I do? I'll start investigating uh, this whole notion of implantables in the body. And by the time I finished my PhD around 2003, uh, I graduated that end of that year. Uh, there was a company on the New York Stock Exchange. That company was very cheap. And I didn't watch that commercial 20-odd uh, years ago, uh, but I definitely was studying, and I had some contact with the very cheap uh, sales representative, Felix, uh, at the time, and uh, a lot of other people that were publishing on the website. Uh, very cheap was a subsidiary uh, of Digital Angel, and this notion of a guardian angel that would be embedded in our bodies and track us as we went around uh, was so much uh, the hype uh, at that time. There were even chip mobile vans going around the state of Maryland around 2003, encouraging people to get chipped. Uh, so this was not a surprise to me in terms of the study of my PhD. Uh, at that time, there were already companies trying to track fleets that were trying to track uh, items. Uh, the term Internet of Things actually came to the fore in 1999 with Kevin Ashton working in Procter & Gamble. So it wasn't like I was shocked that this new innovation uh, of implantables, uh, a tiny uh, size, you know, rice size uh, chip would be placed uh, in the upper tricep of the right arm. The patent, uh, the very chip launched, and you can check this at the US uh, PTO website, uh, was for the implant to go to the right tricep uh, embedded into the transdermal layer of the skin so that at the time, uh, those people who had uh, opted into the uh, very chip would be able to be scanned by emergency uh, responders and also, you know, so if they were incapacitated, uh, they were able to, you know, the uh, health professionals would able to denote whether someone had an allergy to penicillin uh, their previous medication history, uh, their condition, and so forth. Uh, if they were a diabetic, all of these things as, as responders do need to know uh, if you're incapacitated and you're on the emergency table. Um, it didn't take long uh, for the CEO at the time, Scott Silverman, to come out and say, you know, if we had this technology, 9-11 would not have been as disastrous as it was when we realized uh, that the Twin Towers were going to come down, we could have alerted uh, first responders as they went up the stairs uh, to evacuate and we would have lost less personnel. And so from the national security perspective, from the perspective of uh, real-time tracking of your employees, uh, Scott Silverman began to say, well, look, we could have used this uh, to prevent deaths. Uh, and how would people have known? Well, he said, they could have had the implant. We could have sent a message via an electronic bracelet uh, that was Wi-Fi enabled uh, or 2G enabled, and we would be able to give them uh, a red versus green light. Green meaning keep going up the stairs to help those who have been in the terrorist disaster and red meaning evacuate now. And so this began to take get some traction. And the next point in terms of how the very cheap or any implantable device was considered in an employment context was um, when the company CityWatcher.com came into play. Uh, Gary Rutherford was the consultant at CityWatcher, and CityWatcher was a video surveillance company uh, in the state of Ohio in Cincinnati. Gary decided to call me out of the blue in 2009 and said, you know, I've read a lot of your research. I want you to interview me, literally. And so we spent about nine hours over the next week or so discussing his implementation of the very chip uh, at the company CityWatcher.com in 2006. And 
where it was going. Um, and I show you that uh, interview in full. Uh, the original interview was 54 pages of transcription, uh, which then with redactions ended up being about 38 pages. And that 38 pages has been published in peer reviewed journals, looking at risks and rewards. What are the benefits and the costs? Do we go forward? What was Gary's uh, experience of offering an implant service to City Watcher employees? And it was a small organization. Uh, the CEO, Sean Darks, opted to get uh, an implant for the main reason that he kept losing his plastic entry card. Like imagine losing your ASU card and not having entry, physical access into the organization you work for. That actually happened to me last night. I locked my mobile phone and my keys at five o'clock after nine straight appointments and meetings. And I did think, well, what if I had an implant? I did think about that. It's a natural response, you know. I'm sure that wouldn't have helped me when I left my mobile phone behind, but maybe I would have had access to actually go in. The story also goes that the implant now is not being placed on the right tricep. Uh, over time, as the implantable device was uh, adopted by the Baja Beach Club chain in uh, Rotterdam in the Netherlands, and also in Barcelona, Spain, where I've actually gone to visit uh, the now rebranded uh, 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 club, um, I was amazed at the functionality uh, for both the employees in Baja Beach Club in Barcelona, but also for the patrons. And so uh, this, this uh, club is, is right on the shore of a beautiful beach in Barcelona and uh, patrons are able to go into the water, come out, uh, not have to carry you know, an ID, not have to carry uh, their beach towel, just have their bikini and off they go back into the club to boogie all night. Uh, and as you enter, uh, if you're one of the hundred people that had been implanted in Baja Beach Club, your name would appear on an LCD display on the entry. And uh, the uh, Serafim Villaplana, who I interviewed in 2009 as well, said to me, Katina, it was more a gimmick uh, for the club. But people did say, you know, as people came in, uh, with the implant and their name would flash up on the LCD screen, everyone would go, whoa, you know, th there comes another one. Uh, and as if, you know, they had the stored value card uh, embedded in the implant of about, you know, $150. So they were able to buy uh, things uh, and get into VIP patronage uh, in the club. But back to Gary Rutherford. Uh, and Gary's interview was super interesting. You know, we talked about who do you implant, you know, if we're talking about national security, uh, Stephanie, you'd be interested in this. Uh, you know, we're all very much suspicious of one another, but not ourselves. In, in surveys that I've conducted in 2011 and subsequent 2012 and 2013, we've looked at thresholds. You know, no, don't, don't implant me, but implant the guy down the road who I don't know very well. I don't know what he's about or she's about. Um, implant the terrorist or the suspect of a crime Implant the pedophile, but don't implant me. Implant the one who's mentally ill, but don't implant me. Um, so it was a, a very interesting risk versus rewards kind of um, discussion. So Gary points to the fact that when he offered the implant to citywatcher.com employees, uh, initially there was a low take up, uh, less than half of the staff. And some people thought it was creepy. Uh, other people thought, what would my parents say? And other people thought, well, I'll wait to see if that person's arm falls off or gets cancer from the implantable. And if they're okay in six months, then probably I'll opt in. And it was a very interesting transference of adoption. One which only saw two employees initially get implanted and then a third and then a fourth. And over time, because it was a small organization, over time, uh, people were watching to see what will happen to my neighbor and then I'll make a decision. So it's interesting, Gary really, really emphasized the 80-20 rule or the 20-80 rule, Pareto's principle. He said, in the first three years of any adoption of any new emerging technology, you have your early adopters. And that over time, people normalize. People will get on board when they realize the usefulness and the value proposition of that new emerging technology. And we could sort of see that with how we planned out the rollout of our mobile phones uh, when I was working for a network vendor. So initially, 20% of the population will uptake 
And then over three to five years, the rest of the population will get on board. But there will always be the 20% laggards who would say, you know, enough. I don't want to proceed with that. You know, and, and many people resisted the usefulness of the mobile phone until now we have a market saturation of over 100%. People own more than one mobile. And so Gary's uh, position was that this is likely to happen with implantables. So once we see the usefulness for law enforcement, once we see the usefulness for tracking our children and knowing where they are so they're not kidnapped, once we realize uh, the health benefits uh, of having our electronic health record or personal health record implanted in our body, then we would uptake. And I, I ask a pertinent question, but what about those 20% of people that will be left behind? And he says dismissively, ah, they're just the vocal minority. They'll be vocal about anything, whether it's vaccinations, whether it's religious fundamentalism, whether it's, uh, you know, say no for the sake of saying no or save the world because of global warming. And it was fascinating to see his response to the vocal minority. Uh, and, and how does society adopt new technology? Is it the sheep mentality? Are we really thinking about the process of upgrading one to the next? Uh, CityWatcher.com um, was no longer in 2008. Uh, the company folded, uh, the group disbanded. Uh, the employees, uh, as a matter of fact, at CityWatcher and the employees at the Baja Beach Club, both still have those implantable devices. I, I call that space junk in the body. Because uh, when I interviewed Seraphim Villaplana, as there was a change of management, I said, well, now Conrad Chase, the CEO, has gone, and you have a new CEO. What will you do with the implant? And he says, well, I'm just going to leave it in my body. Why would I remove it? It's dormant. It's not doing anything. And I said, but there's no use value for it. And he says, well, so? And so that leads us to ponder on modern developments, um, I can point now to the startup uh, Epicenter uh, that wanted to implant a group of companies in its premises. And um, the individual, Johan Osterlund, who uh, is the CEO of Biohacks International, uh, actually offered his services to the Epicenter Digital Innovation Business Center. If you look at, for example, the clips of the epicenter group of companies themselves, you'll see that people use it for physical access control. People use the implant to actually access the photocopier. People use the implant to do a whole range of things, have doors open for them uh, before they even try to pull the handle. Um, there are all these uh, physical access control that previously required you to enter a pin. Interestingly and embarrassingly, perhaps for some of the organizations, as they demonstrated this, even to the BBC, uh, the implant in the uh, webbing of the thumb and forefinger wasn't really working very well. Uh, you do have a blood barrier in the skin and you have lots of layers of skin and sometimes positioning the implant correctly against the reading device doesn't always work. So you're trying to read and oh, trying to read again. Um, so how, how well does it work? Well, it is going forward uh, in various instances. And here's another company, Three Square Market from Wisconsin, uh, who decided to trial this a few years ago. Um, so here you'll see uh, one of the representatives of Three Square Market uh, talking about how they'll be not only chipping employees at his company, Three Square Market in Wisconsin, but also how they'll connect them to vending machines. And so that instead of fumbling for coins and cash, and cards, you're actually using your own chip implant as a stored value card to actually make a transaction. Um, so now I think let's have a discussion, uh, questions, comments, and, and I want to see what you think uh, about where we're going. Anyone with any thoughts? Um, I just wanted to mention that I've had the opportunity to work with facial recognition programs and also in ASU we have the retinal scan program that allows you to have uh, gain entry and access to our building. I don't know if other buildings have that. Um, facial recognition has flaws. It still needs to be run by human interaction in order to um, have an, ac an accurate depiction in many situations. I did the full database of the driver's license system and you can imagine people look similar and have similar characteristics. 
So there has to be a human element to that. With the microchip, I feel that your information could be, for instance, the motor vehicle division or whatnot. You could go in, scan, your information would come up. It would be a convenience factor in that situation. Um, another thing that I really was interested in is um, I've been able to tour the Arizona counterterrorism um, where they where they house all of our video surveillance for the city of Phoenix and beyond. Someone's always watching you anyways. There's always somebody looking at what everyone is doing, no matter what. We were just speaking this morning with our colleagues about how our phones listen and how, you know, you receive ads for things that you never talk about that you mentioned once. And so with surveillance being the way that it is and the invasion of privacy, how it is currently, I think that's why you're seeing more people just lean towards the yes. At this point, they can control what's on that microchip. They can control what information is given in different places. And I just think that that's why you're seeing more of the yes. And from a security standpoint, um, looking at criminal justice and the way that crime has evolved, if you really think about prison life and how people are incarcerated, this could be something that would exponentially like affect the effectiveness of not only law enforcement, but rehabilitation. Because then you could see if someone had some kind of, uh, for health issues, if they had like a health issue or if they were having some mental health issues, and then those could be addressed separately without having to come to the person and talk to them in front of peers who may look at that as a weakness. So there's a lot of benefits to this. And then there's also a lot of scary things that people have to be on board with sharing. But we share everything, social media, we share our whole lives and we don't even realize that people are tracking us or geo tracking us through those. So I found it really informational. So thank you. Stephanie, um, the area you're working in, I have a, a transnational crime prevention background. Uh, my master's degree was in transnational crime. And so one of the emphases I've had is national security uh, where we not only look at law enforcement and first responders, uh, but then, more internationally, uh, what might this mean? Um, I think you raised some pertinent points uh, about the current adoption of technologies. And I do believe, uh, as you stated, that these things are listening, perhaps accidentally for now, uh, without our realizing. We did have uh, Google, for example, uh, declare that the Nest device uh, had an embedded audio device. And sorry, we didn't tell you about it. We always meant to tell you, but. Um, you know, it just didn't cross our minds that anyone would really want to know that there was an audio sensor uh, embedded in the smoke detector we're selling and the um, human activity monitoring system for entertainment and so forth we've got out there. But is there a difference? And I want you to look at this big chunk of thing because I actually believe what I learned in Nortel 20 years ago, that this device will eventually be embedded and we won't have to carry a separate token. Um, I also um, think that we have a false sense of security. Um, we believe that the embedded device is the safe device and the secure device, the right device that can't be transferred because it's embedded, uh, can't be cloned because there's only one of them and uh, is invisible. So really um, is secure from the perspective uh, against denial of service attacks or, or hacks. Just today, however, we learned um, Medtronic's uh, um, defibrillators in human bodies, uh, 750,000 of them uh, have had vulnerability security uh, on heightened alert by the US government. In fact, it, didn't, it wasn't the manufacturer who, who said there's a problem with our uh, security on these devices. It was the US government who declared that this morning. So almost three quarters of a million devices are vulnerable to attack. And they mentioned between 14 and 17 known different types of security hacks. So, you know, death by internet. Um, I, I do ponder if we extrapolate that further and we believe in the security, Gartner back in 2004, when Verichip was launching, um, said, hang on a second, you know, we need better privacy protections. We need better security mechanisms um, before we even consider RFID for first responders, for law enforcement, for security, for national security, for citizen security, for citizen purchasing, et cetera, et cetera. More recently, uh, what we've seen is the BioSpark, BioCrypt, uh, 
crypto, crypto spark uh, implant. This was launched only um, uh, a few months ago. In crypto bionic, I think it was called. Um, and the spark uh, is about plugging in or plugging the gaps and the holes. And I find it amusing and amazing at the same time that the Vivo Key Spark uh, cylindrical um, chip that you place into your 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 hand is been has been called the crypto bionic chip. You know, I don't know what the bionic comes from. You know, it's not really bionic. It doesn't let you see further. It doesn't let you retain more data. What's the bionic part, which might be interest relevant to you, Stephanie, with within biodesign? But the crypto part, I get. They're talking about onboard encryption, you know, AES 128 bit strong cryptography, which we've not seen before and sort of addresses the concerns of Gartner Research Company back in 2004. So now that it's perhaps unclonable, although I'd say no technology uh, is not subject to security risks, do we go forward with this? Do we make it our one stop shop for, you know, knowing where someone is in an emergency situation, knowing where a school child is? knowing where someone suffering with dementia is when it's tethered to some kind of watch perhaps or phone uh, through GPS. Um, so you use the implant for an indoor read or a, a, a RFID NFC read perhaps at a, at a station, a train station or, or an airport or a bus depot and then you'd, you'd require the GPS for that global uh, positioning. So the implant is which what we say in ubervalence uh, terms that lowest common denominator identification, you know, uh, and that most um, granular level location information we could get and condition information actually, because it's reading vital signs potentially as well. Things like not only temperature, heartbeat uh, or pulse rate, I should say, uh, but also things like what direction you're traveling in. Are you going north, east, west? Are you, um, coming in or going out of a, of a gantry point uh, or simply cycling round and round. So we can start to do traffic profiling at a, at a very uh, detailed level, but I think this raises a great deal of implications for those who don't want to opt in to that kind of future. Um, but do we replace the 3M pedophile trackers, you know, or those that trackers that we use for extended surveillance or extended supervision orders, ESOs? Do we use those 3M sort of clip on and can't remove devices um, uh, on the pedophiles and replace them with these non-invasive, non-viewable implantables, you know, so people can wear shorts and a t-shirt and perhaps have a chance at rehabilitation without stigma. But these are lots of things and lots of questions um, that you raised, Stephanie, and um, I'm very grateful for your openness to, to, to consider all aspects uh, of these chips. Thank you for listening and uh, replying about that. I, this is incredibly interesting to me, so thank you. you. You know, Stephanie, I'm trying to remember if I saw you at the GETS conference last year or the year before. Have you gone no. to Learning Technologies? No, um, that would be really interesting too. Yes, you've Check got to come to me. Thank you. Tell us about your research. I, I know um, you're working in a, uh, an area investigating tracking can you tell us um, how that sort of intersects with some of the things we've been speaking about? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, uh, so, so those of you who don't know, I'm thinking a lot about proxy surveillance, which is the way that we're surveilled um, without, it's the way that we're surveilled when we think that we are the surveillors. So as I think that I'm monitoring you, I'm also monitoring myself um, and the ways that that exposes me or makes me vulnerable or, you know, however that affects me. Um, and one of the things that I found really interesting thinking about, Stephanie, your comment was, you know, you were saying, well, our phones are already listening, right? And you lock yourself out of your office, you leave your phone, like, so this is better. This is the conditions we're under now, but with added convenience. Um, and one of the things that keeps coming up in my research and that this reminded me of is that, like, I have the agency, though, to put my phone away. Mm -hmm. And I have the agency, I can at any moment opt in or opt out. So even if my phone is listening, um, even if it's broadcasting my location when it's off, um, I can put my phone into the freezer and I can take my dog to the park and be effectively untracked, except by the public cameras that I, <laughs> that I cannot opt out of. Um, 
you know, I can't unimplant. Um, and so, you know, I think a lot about the agency of individuals within these large socio-technical systems and how much we really have. Um, but I think at the, the implant removes the last bit of agency we for sure have, which is to check out a little bit. And that for me is kind of really concerning. Uh, JP, I don't know if you're still online. Uh, do you have any thoughts? Oh, I'm here. I just, um, <laughs> I'm listening mostly. Um, okay. I mean, I don't know. I'm, um, actually, I don't, I don't have strong intuitions as to how I feel about this technology on a personal level. Actually, um, <clears throat> I expect that as with most innovations of, of, of whatever variety, um, attempts to roll these things out for any given purpose will um, have a variety of, unpredict of unpredicted and potentially unpredictable features. Um, and as such, I am curious about if these things, or if, the, if these are to be implemented, um, how, their implementation, how their implementation can be made flexible, can, make, can be made reflexive, can be made iterative. Um, so I can just repeat the repeat the responsible innovation party line, basically. <laughs> um, it, se it seems to me that, that the nature of these things, as these of these devices, as as very small implanted objects, um, makes them a little a little a little more rigid than than um, than a, a bracelet so that someone can take out and take off and easily trade and easily trade in and out without a medical procedure or something like that. Um, and I wonder, I wonder if you feel that if you agree that this technology, once implemented, would tend to be more rigid, or do you think it's it's it's, it's the, that the that the technology itself and the and the systems within which it of which it is part and parcel would be more easily modified than I'm thinking? Uh, wise comments, uh, both Nikki and JP. I, I um, when I was doing my law degree, masters, um, I studied. Uh, the idea of hot pursuit. So you have international law enforcement organizations like Interpol or Europol, and they cross borders. And I was looking at what happens with location-based services as we hand off uh, from one local authority to another and try and coordinate this idea of hot pursuit as we're chasing a perpetrator. And then I came across case law because that's what I was looking for which identified scenarios where school teachers, social workers, and a whole other gambit of types of work, um, workers were being offered mobile phones as part of their package, right? So they were offered the ability to have a free phone as they conducted their business, which often required them to move around. And one of the uh, contestations was really about, well, I leave my job at 5 p.m. What right is it of my employer to track me at 5.01 and 6 and 10 p.m. and know that I was sleeping at my home five days of the week and for the weekend I went elsewhere? What right is it for my employer to know what I do on the weekend? Because what the individual employees didn't know is that they were being tracked using location services. And although it was proven that when they signed the paperwork to actually accept the ownership and responsibility of the mobile phone and the costs that came with it, there was fine print that said that they were being geographically tracked, but they weren't, uh, you know, told at point blank uh, verbally, you know, you're signing something and it's, we're giving you something and, and that allows us to track you after hours. And the reason why the companies were tracking, and in fact, in one of the cases, it was state government, was because they wanted to demonstrate and prove that the individual asking for remuneration on their worksheet every week was actually where they said they were. And on one occasion, there was a teacher who was not where they were supposed to be. So they were claiming for monies, right? And they had not, and they were claiming for monies at a particular time, but they hadn't been clocked there during that day. So they were cross checking whether someone's worksheet was actually uh, matching uh, the actual location-based services. And so that inspired in me um, tracking studies where I asked students through ethics approval, uh, with ethics approval, to track them for four weeks at a time. And they kept a daily diary and they also had an electronic submission of their waypoints during the day 
for four weeks at a time. And what some students did is they decided to turn off the tracking devices. Um, in early experiments back in 2005, we had uh, somebody using a large Magellan device, uh, which they put in their pants, their pants, their khaki pants, um, and they went about their life. I said, why did you switch off the GPS? He said, I didn't want my mum to know where I was. And, you know, that's a very farcical, you know, you can have a good laugh about that. Um, and then as, as we progressed through time, I did these experiments again and again, and people didn't say I turned it off just so my mother wouldn't know where I was. People started to do funny things with the actual tracking software. For example, obfuscate their location. Say they were somewhere deliberately that they were not. Uh, and in other cases, what they did is they played uh, jokes uh, with their mates. For example, one friend uh, who had locked their location to their office was actually at the pub and then uh, brought up the desktop of where his friend was via friend sharing of location to his wife. So his wife calls him up and says, you know, where are you? I need you. The kids need you. And he said, oh, I'll be done at the office, you know, within a couple of minutes. And in fact, she knew uh, that he was at the pub and they all had a good laugh. Can I but, ask a question? Yes. Um, so the, the adage goes wherever there's surveillance, wherever there's control, there's resistance, which is exactly what you're saying, right? People are being tracked and then they're trying to resist either physically or technologically. Um, yep. Is there resistance happening with people who have implants? Not to be tracked? Or, or just like, you know, people using it, you know, uh, Jackie, um, writes about how the first pedometers were the people who are trying to track their steps uh workmen and they would put the workmen on the workmen would put the pedometers on the pistons of the engines and yes. so to generate the steps um so are people who have implants or are anyone is anyone talking about like being surveilled through the implant and somehow finding a way to resist so Good question, Nikki, and I, I think that's probably new, newish territory. Um, when my husband Michael spoke uh, at the Privacy Commissioners Conference back in 2007, he presented on ubervalence and described that we will get to that point. Um, he said the three flaws of ubervalence, while we were looking for total information awareness, we were looking at the potential uh, to have the all-seeing eye, a godlike eye, to have omniscience, true omniscience for a change, and if real-time omnipresence, um, he claimed that we'd always be at the mercy of information manipulation, misrepresentation, and um, misinformation. And he said, no matter what we do, whether we've got identity, this is the definition of ubervalence, it's identity with location information, with condition information, and if you're lucky, some photographic uh, point of view. So with these three or four additional things, you allegedly have the all-seeing eye. It's what you're saying. You know, I know whether you've got sweaty palms. I know whether you've just run a marathon. I know whether you've been stationary. I know whether you're taking your drugs on time uh, through behavioral tracking. I know all of these things. But he says context is always missing, no matter if you've got a real-time CCTV camera beaming at you. You've got the implant, so we know it's definitely you. You've got the location fix. We know you're in that office and we know how you're feeling, you know, your temperature's rising, you're not well. He said, always context is missing. And this is the problem that we have with point of view is that we think because of all of these layers, we actually know what the person is thinking and doing. And I think the revolt is uh, twofold. One, which came out of the conference in 2007, where Mark Roberti and David Lyon, the surveillance expert, was also there, was, are we going to get to the point where we're wearing tinfoil hats? where we're wearing particular paraphernalia around our hands or our implant zone, so that we have an on-off switch. Again, when Michael was presenting at a conference in England, uh, in fact, at the British Computer Society back in 2005, uh, with the CIO of Cisco uh, and also Ken Wood of Microsoft, they said this would be all great if we had an on-off switch. While implants will be able to be turned off in the future or at least placed some kind of Faraday cage on the outside, we are going to get into it further than we want. It's exactly what JP was talking about, the retrospective use, the scope creep, the function creep. Oh, we can use it for health records. Next, we can use it to track you. Next, we can use it to put you behind bars, uh, you know, because we're not sure about you. Um, so 
at what point are we going to say enough's enough with this innovation? And the sad thing I've seen is that the biohacking community, in which was initially very much against things like this facial recognition scanning. You know, I have a, 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 an interview with Amor Grafstra back in 2007. He is the owner of DangerousThings.com, who said to me, I denounce the fact that Disney World and Disneyland required my fingerprints and my wife's fingerprints after I paid my money at the entry. And they said, you know, we're going to take your scanning. He said, why couldn't they have told me that beforehand? He said, I didn't want my fingerprints scanned. And he saw that as more invasive than implantables. The fact that your unique identifier would be taken at entry rather than the token that he had. And he had two of them in his hands. But what's happening today is that these same biohacking companies that were all about freedom and being yourself and citizen science and let's see how we can go with our tinkering projects have now started to communicate with large corporations, security organizations and governments across the world to go now, what can we do to implant the populace? And that's where I think the biohacking ethic has somehow suffered because potentially we see this as the grand solution, but we're not willing to admit that it's the, perhaps the most dire solution we might be sending humankind to. So maybe some last comments from each of you and, and we could wrap up. Stephanie, perhaps we'll start with you, could we? Do you have any closing thoughts? Um, no, I just, I really enjoyed hearing about this type of technology and how it could be used or the constraints thereof or the possibility of what could happen. I find it very interesting and innovative. So that's all I have. Thank you so much. Thanks, Stephanie, for coming. Nikki? Um, sure. Uh, this is great. Thank you. I'm opposed to all of it. <laughs> Thank you for all of it. <laughs> Um, and it gives me a lot to think about in terms of like uh, having an off switch and why vulnerability is now such a hot thing when we have all this data about us and the data feels very intimate, but also not intimate. So uh, there's tons of stuff for me to think of. So I really appreciate that. Thanks, Nikki. Um, I concur with you. This would be going down the wrong path if we pursued this, this technology as a, a solution for all things, um, even law enforcement. Uh, JP. Yeah, this, is, this has been, um, I, will, I will echo um, our, our fellows and say, yeah, this has been very interesting and um, thank you very much for, for hosting this, for talking to us about this today. And thank you for, and thank um, all of you for also coming and, um, and contributing. Um, yeah, no, I don't, um, I have, you know, sort of a, a visceral um, revulsion <laughs> to this idea, um, but I, I um, I think that as with a lot of things to which I have, a lot of th things to which I have a visceral revulsion, um, that, um, well, how, I don't know, it should be governed in the democratic, it should be, decisions about these things should be made in a democratic um, and participatory fashion and uh, whatever, you know. Um, no, I don't, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in how, in, in accounting, what matters is what's being counted, right? That, that's how that's how institutions come to know the the individuals whom they aim to govern and understand and govern. Um, whatever whatever information you take and you flatten or you take um, and necessarily flatten out the rest becomes the the become, becomes the identity of the person the of the persons whom whom you're trying to collect and draw together such that you can map them out and understand them. Um, so I don't know. I would I would hope that with these and other sorts of tracking technologies, persons are, could have some sort of input into into the systems in which they are enrolled by necessity, by necessity or by choice. Um, I, I would hope that that persons being enrolled in these systems could um, have some agency over how they wish to be counted and and what what components of identity they wish to be to be known by. I don't know. Thank you, JP. Um, I'll pass back to Rebecca Pringle to close. Yeah, thank you. This was very, this was really interesting. And uh, thank you so much, Katina, for volunteering your time. And thank you, everyone, for signing up. And